Hello everybody and welcome back to the Texas Podcast. I am your host Gabe and today is another episode of Regiment Histories. Still on the topic of the Texas Revolution, but this regiment is, you guessed it, the Texas Rangers. See, in 1823, only two years after Anglo-American colonization formally began in Texas, Empresario Stephen F. Austin hired 10 experienced frontiersmen as rangers for a punitive expedition against a band of Indians. But it was not until November 24th, 1835, did Texas lawmakers institute a specific force known as the Texas Rangers. The organization had a complement of 56 men and three companies, each officered by a captain to lieutenant, whose immediate superior and leader had the rank of major and was subject to the commander-in-chief of the regular army. The major was responsible for enlisting recruits, enforcing rules, and applying discipline. Officers received the same pay as United States Dragoons and Privates, $1.25 a day. However, they supplied their own mounts, equipment, arms, and rations. At all times, they had to be ready to ride, equipped with a good and sufficient horse and with 100 rounds of powder and shot. Even with such official sanctions, the Rangers did not fare especially well at first during the Texas Revolution. They served sparingly as scouts and couriers, then carried out a number of menial tasks. As settlers fled east to escape the advancing uh, armies after the fall of the Alamo on March 6, 1836, the Rangers retrieved cattle, convoyed refugees across muddy trails and swollen streams, and destroyed produce or equipment left behind. In fact, during the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21st, they were on escort duty. Nor did their situation improve appreciably over the next two years because President Sam Houston favored government economy as well as friendship with the Indians. In December 1838, however, Mirabu B. Lamar succeeded the presidency and immediately changed the frontier policies of the Republic as well as the role of the Rangers. At his behest, Congress allowed him to recruit eight companies of mounted volunteers and maintain a company of 56 Rangers, then a month later to provide for five similar companies in Central Texas and South Texas. Over the next three years, the Rangers waged all-out war against the Indians, successfully participating in numerous pitched battles. The most notable were the Cherokee Wars in East Texas in July 1839, the Council House Fight at San Antonio against the Comanches in March 1840, and the Battle of Plum Creek against 1,000 Comanche warriors in August 1840. By the end of, Lam of the Lamar administration, Texans had undermined if not broken the strength of the most powerful tribes. Sam Houston, upon being re-elected to the presidency in December 1841, realized that ranger companies were the least expensive and the most efficient way to protect the frontier. As a result, 150 rangers under Captain John Coffee Jack Hayes figured prominently in helping repel the Mexican invasions of 1842, and in successfully protecting Texans against Indians, Indian attacks over the next few years. Hayes initiated ranger traditions in the Espirit de Corps by recruiting and training a tough contingent of men skilled in uh, frontier warfare. Out of his command arose such famous rangers, uh, ranger captains as Ben and Henry McLow, Samuel H. Walker, W.A.A. Bigfoot Wallace, and Robert Addison Ad Gillespie. With the annexation of Texas in the Mexican-American War in 1846, the Rangers achieved worldwide fame as a fighting force. After acquitting themselves admirably during the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de Palma on May 8th through the 9th, 1846, they became General Zachary Taylor's eyes and ears. Superbly mounted and armed to the teeth with a large assortment of weapons and obviously at home in the desert wastes of northern Mexico, they found the most practical route for the uh, American army to Monterey. Late in September, the Rangers rashly set the tempo and set for Taylor's successful storming of the city. Although furloughed in October for after a brief armistice, they returned early in 1847 in time to provide the general enough military information to help win the Battle of Buena Vista in February. In March 1847, the theater of war shifted. An American army under General Winfield Scott landed at Veracruz and quickly muscled its way into the Valley of Mexico. For the next five months, the Rangers under Jack Hayes and Samuel Walker figured prominently in American victories. In fact, so ruthless and lethal were they against Mexican guerrillas that a hostile but fearful populace called them Los Diablos Tejanos, meaning the Texas Devils. The Mexican-American War ended on February 2, 1848. The Rangers became, for the next decade, as historian Walter Prescott Webb asserted, little more than a historical expression. Since the United States had rightly assumed responsibility for protecting the Texas frontier, the Rangers had no official function, nor did the state try to enlist their services. 
The organization thus lost its famous captains as well as the nucleus of its frontier defenders. But after the appointment of John S. Rip Ford as senior captain in January 1858, the Rangers briefly upheld their fighting traditions. Late in the spring, they moved north to the Red River to chastise a large band of hostiles in the process, killing the noted Comanche chief Iron Jacket. Then in March 1859, Ford and his men were assigned to the Brownsville area, where together with the United States Army, they gained only limited success against the Red Robber of the Rio Grande, Juan and Cortina. For 14 years after this campaign, however, the Rangers ceased to be either significant or effective. With the coming of the Civil War in 1861, they rushed individually to the Confederate colors. Although the 8th Texas Cavalry was known as Terry's Texas Rangers, its founder, Benjamin F. Terry, was never a member of the state's organization, nor did he necessarily recruit experienced fighters. To protect its frontiers, the state had to rely on young boys, old men, or rejects from Confederate conscription. Subsequently, during Reconstruction Era, either the United States Army or the state police were responsible for carrying out such duties, though they had little success. But in 1874, the state Democrats returned to power, and so did the Rangers. Texas was overrun with bad men, with Indians ravaging the western frontier, with, Mexicans band, with Mexican bandits pillaging and murdering along the Rio Grande. The legislature authorized two unique military groups to this emergency. The first was a special force of rangers under Captain Leander H. McNelly. In 1874, he and his men helped curb lawlessness endangered by the deadly Sutton Taylor feud in Duet County. In the spring of 1875, they moved into Nueces Strip between Corpus Christi and the Rio Grande to combat Cortina's favorite bravos. After eight months of fighting, the Rangers had largely restored order, if not peace, in the area. In 1875, the Special Force enhanced its fearful reputation by stacking 12 dead rustlers like cordwood in the Brownsville Square as a lethal response to the death of one Ranger. McNally also participated in Los Cuervos' War, wherein he violated international law by crossing the Rio Grande, attacking Mexican nationals, and retrieving stolen American cattle. The second military unit designated the Frontier Battalion was equally effective, composed of six companies with 75 rangers in each. Under Major John B. Jones, the battalion part participated in 15 Indian battles in 1874, and together with the United States Cavalry, destroyed the power of the fierce Comanches and Kiowas by the end of 1875. The battalion also thinned out more than 3,000 desperados such as a bank robber, Sam Bass, and notorious gunfighter, John Wesley Hart. Therefore, because of its efficiency, the Frontier Battalion was no longer necessary after 1882. For the next three decades, the Rangers retreated before the onslaught of civilization, their prominence and prestige waning as the need for frontier law enforcement lessened. They occasionally intercepted Mexican and Indian marauders along the Rio Grande, contended with uh, cattle thieves, especially in the Big Bend country and the Panhandle at the times, protected blacks from white lynch mobs. By 1900, such relative in, uh, inactivity persuaded critics to urge the curtailment, if not complete abandonment of the Rangers. As a result, in 1901, the legislator cut the force to four companies, each headed by a captain who could recruit no more than 20 men. Only because of the leadership and valor of such captains as J.A. Brooks, William, G. Or William Jesse McDonald, John H. Rogers, and John R. Hughes were the Rangers able to maintain their existence and traditions during the lean years of the 1890s and the 1900s. The Rangers went on to uh, disband in early, in early 1914, and most of them went to, you know, went to World War I and to enlist in the U.S. Army. Then in 1916, most of them went to go help Pancho Villa raid the Columbus in New Mexico and from then on the Rangers kept fighting and when they kept fighting they I mean they're they're Texas Rangers they got the Texas spirit Texans never give up they always fight the Texas Rangers are also famous for I mean Texas consequently became a haven for the lawless I mean the likes of Raymond Hamilton George Machine Gun Kelly Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker although the Texas Rangers are responsible for the killing of Bonnie and Clyde, which were two of the most notorious gangs in the 1820s, they are responsible for the killing of them. But as time went on, the Rangers started thinning out, and the garrison eventually died in 1968. It was then brought back by the Texas state for the toughness against the criminal element in 1996. And since then, 
it, it's expanded and well the rangers is nowadays is a hard company or police force to get into since september 1996 the force has expanded to 105 men and since then it's gone up and it's gone down the rangers is quite an interesting regiment of the texas revolution in, in my opinion because there's so much to know about them so much to learn and i mean all in all they're just i mean they started in 1823 with a small colony of more than 13 families and protecting them from Indians and then went on to be this huge thing in the Civil War after that helping the United States Calvary win in the Texas Indian Wars and then going on dwindling away little by little in the 1900s but then coming back strong in the late 1900s and going strong to this day I mean that's a good story that is that is like an interesting story that that it makes people interested you know wanting to hear the Texas Rangers story because man are these guys so strong to get themselves through through so much and man have they been around for such a long time and they still maintain that Texas spirit that's why the Texas Rangers will always be the most interesting regiment and I think my most favorite regiment of the Texas Revolution and I think all of Texas in general anyways I want to thank y'all all for tuning in today uh today was I, i'd say today was I, I probably shouldn't have favorite podcast but today was my favorite definitely most like I, this one was my favorite one because I, I i i love the texas rangers dude like there's nothing that can beat the texas rangers i want to thank you all for tuning in and uh i'll see y'all next time